everybody. Good morning and welcome to Vantage Point Church. Hey, it is going to be an awesome Sunday. And as we get ready for worship, uh, I wanted to come back here, hang out with my boy Dagger. What's up? Dagger is one of our worship leaders on the team. And Dagger, I just wanted to ask you, like, how are you feeling about today? What's your kind of hope for the audience and for anyone watching from home in regards of worship? Yeah, I'm very excited for this morning. For worship specifically, I want to encourage you guys, as you've gone through your week, you've probably had some weak moments, you probably had some down time, you know, down moments. And I want to encourage you, the Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness. So it is okay to be weak, um, but turn to God and that's what we're going to sing about this morning. Amen, man. We're already kicking it off with some preaching. Uh, well, hey, as the worship band gets ready and gets set to lead us in this morning's time of worship, uh, I just want to encourage you, you be, be doing what you can to get your heart ready. Remember that God is with you, and man, it's just going to be such a great Sunday. Again, welcome to Vantage Point. Right? Some of us may have had some weak moments throughout the week. Some of us, it was a battle just getting to the parking lot, right? And you're like in your seat and you're like, you can breathe a breath of relief. I made it to church, right? And so we're going to be singing about God's faithfulness. The Bible says that my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness. That should bring you comfort, knowing that it's okay to be weak. It's okay to have your low points, but know that God's power is made perfect in those and that his grace is sufficient. Do you guys believe that? Come on, come on. We're going to sing. Uh, start with an oldie this morning. Let's, let's lift our voices. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Lift it up. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comfort. My all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. Let's give our God some praise. Come on. Everything around me 
foundation this morning, you will make it through. So let's sing this together.
Trust in your promises, trust in your faithfulness, that we would come to you for our joy, for our peace, for our strength, God, because that is where we will find it. God, we thank you for this morning. I pray that we would grow closer to you through your word, your song. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, thank you guys so much for singing with us. It's a good morning. You can have a seat. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Hey, we want to give you guys a special welcome this morning. Hey, my name is Christian Alvarez. I'm the student ministries pastor here. Uh, and if it is your first time here, hey, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We would actually love to give you a gift just for coming out for your first time. So after service out in the lobby or out in the front of the church, you're going to see these big old green flags. They're super hard to miss. Uh, head over to one of those. We've got some volunteers stationed over there, again, who would just love to get you that gift into your hands and say, hey, thanks for joining us today. Um, a couple quick announcements we want to let you guys know about. We've been talking to our 930 and 11 o'clock services because what we've come to find out is that those are often the most impacted services. I guess they're the most popular. I kind of like, I kind of like eight o'clock, right? But... But for some reason, people like to sleep in a little bit, go to those services. And so uh, we've been talking to them about, hey, let's let's try to move to the uh, to the 8 o'clock and to the 1230 services. Because what that does is it frees up an open space in those most popular times for people to come and for people to come hear the word of God, maybe for the very first time. And so, hey, if you are in this service because you've made that move, we just want to we just want to thank you guys so much for coming out and doing that. Uh, and if, you ha if you're like, hey, this is my first time, but I want to make that commitment, you guys can always scan the QR code on the screen and make that commitment online as well. Uh, a couple things we want to let you guys know about. Uh, tonight, 
we are hosting here at Vantage Point in our auditorium the That Sounds Fun uh, podcast tour with Annie F. Downs. Yep. Hey, if you guys don't know who Annie F. Downs is, man, she is she's a boss. Like she <laughs> she's awesome. I mean, she ho- she is an author and a podcast host of the That Sounds Fun podcast. But uh, she ho- she interviews people like. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, Louis Giglio, authors, pastors, actors, uh, musicians, all of all, all these crazy people. Uh, she hosts these people on her podcast. And tonight she is going to be doing a live podcast here in our auditorium. And so if that sounds like something you want to be a part of, come through. Uh, all you got to do is buy your ticket online. Just scan the QR code, click on the That Sounds Fun link, and uh, we will see you guys tonight at 730. Uh, last thing I want you to know t- about tonight, church, or today, is uh, on March 18th, we are hosting essentially a welcome committee uh, because we know this, that uh, in Eastville especially, man, we are always seeing new families come through, and we we as the church want to be one of the first people to welcome them, right? And so what we're going to be doing is on March 18th, we're going to be sending a group of people out to uh, just drop off some welcome mats and uh, just let people know, hey, we are so glad that they're a part of our neighborhood. Uh, and so if that sounds like something you want to be a part of, uh, go ahead and sign, or scan the QR code on the screen, fill out the opportunity to serve. And last thing I want you to know about church is that uh, everything you see happen here at Vantage Point, whether it's here on a Sunday or out in the community, happens because of your generosity. And so we want to encourage you to continue giving with us uh, online at vantagepointchurch.org slash give. Uh, through texting Vantage Point to 77977 or in the offering box on your way out of service. But right now, let's get into our service, Hot and Bothered. Good morning, everybody. Hey, if you don't know who I am, my name is Mark Lee. I'm one of the pastors here at Vantage Point Church. We are right in the middle of a series that we've started started called Hot and Bothered. And here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you to consider this week's message as almost kind of a continuation of last week's message. Last week's message, what you're going to find is that, uh, man, we as Christians are called to embrace both the tension of grace and truth, that we are not to compromise truth, but at the same time that we are not to be Christian jerks about it. And that's what Caleb helped us do. Caleb helped us understand how do we react and how do we treat people who are different from us. We treat them with love. We treat them with acceptance. Now, what I'm going to do today is just a little bit different because what I want to do today is I want to help us think through the topic a little bit more. And so since it's a two-part message, here's what I'd love for you to do. Uh, If today sounds a little bit sterile and a little bit boring, I'd love for you to refer back to last week's message. And if you felt like last week's message was a little bit like just heavy on the grace side, here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you to refer back to this week's message. They're like the two towers, okay? Caleb was Isengard, and I'm that other tower. I don't I don't know what the name of the other tower is, honestly. So um, today what you're going to find is that uh, the topic that we're going to be talking about today is only easy for you if you do not have a gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, or transgender friend. Today is only going to be easy for you if you have never been invited to a gay wedding. Today is only going to be easy for you if you've never had a son or a daughter come to you and lay that bombshell of those two words on you, I'm gay. See, what you're going to find is that this topic is much more sensitive, it's much more complicated, it's much more nuanced, it's much more emotional than anyone could possibly give it credit for. And so today what I want to be able to do as your pastor is I want to help you. I want to help all of us be able to not only think through the topic a little bit more, but what I want to be able to help all of us do is help, to help us understand how, like, how do, we, how do we react? How do we deal with the situation? How do we deal with the situation? How do we think through the situation? Because what do I do? Like, Pastor, what do I do if my 12-year-old daughter comes to me and tells me that she is a lesbian? 
What do I do if my 20-year-old grandson comes up to me and tells me that he's gay? Well, here's the first thing that I think you should do, and that's this right here. I think you need to lead with grace. And what I mean by that is this. Be very, very, very careful. Because what you say in those first couple seconds will forever define your relationship. And if you lead with judgment, if you lead with criticism, and if you lead with anger, what's going to happen is that tr the tremendous courage that it took for somebody to come up to you and tell you that will all evaporate and that person will withdraw from you. But in those moments, if you lead with acceptance, if you lead with, lead with love, if you lead with patience, now understand that I'm not saying agreement. If you lead in those moments with love and acceptance and grace, you know what you're going to end up doing? You're going to end up positioning yourself so that when your child, your grandchild, your friend needs you the most, you will be the first phone call that they make. And that's what I want to do for my child. Like for my child, if my child ever has a question or if my child ever has a challenge, here's what I want to have happen. I want to be the first phone call that they make. And so if somebody comes to you and says those two words, here's what I would do, and maybe this isn't what you would do, but you know what I would say? I would say thank you. Thank you for telling me that. Man, it took a lot. I bet it took a lot of courage for you to tell me that, right? Yeah. I would, I would lean in. I would ask some questions. I would say, hey, where do you feel like all of this started? How do you feel like you came to that conclusion? And as a part of all of that leaning in and asking some of those questions, here is one of the questions that I might ask, and that's this question right here. When you say that you're gay, when you say that you're a lesbian, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Are you talking about attraction or are you talking about action? Are you talking about the fact that maybe that you're, um, are, are, are you confused about where you fit gender-wise, that you don't quite fit in with the rest of the guys, that you don't quite fit in with the rest of the girls? What do you, are, are you talking about who you are, or are you talking about what you do? Because what you're going to find is that, man, this whole um, umbrella term of homosexuality is much broader. It has a greater range than you and I necessarily think. And you and I have got to be able to think critically, biblically, through three important topics. Are we talking about attraction? Are we talking about action? Or am I talking about identity? Do you understand where I'm going with this? Are, are we talking about attraction? Are we talking about action? Or are we talking about identity? So let's go ahead and address all three of these topics, if that's okay with you. The first one is attraction. And here's a question that I'd love to ask you. That's this question right here. Is it a sin to be tempted by the same sex? Is that a sin? If I have a same-sex attraction that exists in my life, is that a sin? Okay, let's go ahead and narrow that question down just a little bit, if that's okay. Is it a sin to be tempted? Is it, is it a sin to be tempted? Like, for example, if you are on the beach, let's say you're on the Huntington Beach Pier, and then all of a sudden, you know, this very, um, you know, like, scantily clad woman walks by, and all of a sudden, in that moment, you have a not-so-faithful thought. Can I ask you this? Is that a sin? The answer is no. It's not. Because what you're going to find is that sin is not in what I do with my first thought. Sin is actually what I do with my second thought. That in other words, that I cannot control the thought. Like, if I say this, like, don't think about pink elephants, don't think about pink elephants, don't think about pink elephants... What are you going to think about? You're going to think about pink elephants, that I cannot control the thought that comes into my head, but what I can do is I can control what I do with that thought once it arrives. So as it pertains to you and the bikini-clad lady on Huntington Beach Pier, the sin is not the first look, the sin is in the second look. Does that make sense? Where you're going to find it is that Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this right here. For we do not have a high priest. There's, uh, the author is speaking of Jesus right now. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been, Jesus, tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not, say it with me, 
Yet he did not sin. You know what the author is telling us? That Jesus was tempted in every single way. Was he tempted in the way that we're talking about? I don't know. All I know is that the Bible says that he was tempted in every way, and yet he did not sin. What I'm trying to say is this, that if you have been same-sex attracted, there is no guilt in that. There is no shame in that. You have done nothing wrong. Do you know why? Because the sin is not in the first thought. The sin is what I choose to do with that thought. Am I going to engage that thought? Or am I going to resist that thought? Am I going to fight that thought? Or am I going to fan that thought into flame? Now, the controversy doesn't come in what I, uh, where the first, first thought comes from. The controversy comes in a little bit more with, can I control the second thought? Is that something that I can control or is that something that I cannot control? Is that something that I have power over or is that something that I do not have power over? Is it even possible for me to control that second thought? Lisa Diamond, researcher uh, with the American Psychological Association, a a secular organization, and a professed lesbian, not a Christian, cited this in the 2014 APA, American Psychological Association Handbook of Sexuality and Psychology, to her own surprise, by the way. She says this right here. Let's walk through it together. A little bit dry, but we're going to explain it. Contrary to the conventional wisdom that individuals with exclusive same-sex attractions, controversy to the popular thinking that, that, that my same-sex attraction that cannot be controlled and cannot be adjusted, that contrary to that idea that that represents the majority and that those with bisexual patterns or that those people who are a little bit more fluid and can control those thoughts are infrequent exceptions, the opposite is actually true. Individuals with non-exclusive patterns of attraction are the norm, and those with exclusive same-sex attractions are the exception. Let's time out for a second. Do you know, do you know what she's saying? What she's saying is that according to her research, that sexual feelings are not fixed. That depending upon environment, that depending upon trauma, that depending upon people, that, imp- that depending upon the situation that we find ourselves in, that our sexual feelings can actually change. And that they can change for more people than we think. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, uh, the book, The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but he describes how lesbianism actually grew in the Soviet prison system after Sol- Stalin separated the men from the women. And Solzhenitsyn says this right here in his book, women suffered worse than the men from the relational separation and lesbian love developed swiftly. We see this in our own system, prison system, right? Men who would have never, ever, even in their wildest dreams, maybe considered a same-sex attraction, all of a sudden being exposed to a different environment, you know, uh, finds their sexual feelings being a little bit more fluid, right? Uh, College has a term for this. You know what it's called in college? Have you ever heard the term lug? Anybody ever heard the term lug? It stands for lesbian until graduation, And the idea is that, you know, that, um, that when you go off to college, you're 18 years old, you're still at a relatively impressionable age, right? You find yourself in an environment that maybe has a different value system than the value system that, they, that you're in. Is it even possible that my value system begins to adjust and it begins to become more fluid? And then when I leave that value system, what then begins to happen is that then I adjust to the different value system that I find myself in after I leave college as well. Here's what I'm trying to say. Is it even possible? Is it even a possibility that a young man who loves theater finds himself really good at the fine arts, finds himself really good at dance and ballet, and ex- is exposed to maybe a different set of values? And invi- Is it even possible that that young man might be a little bit impressionable? 
Is it even possible that a young woman who finds herself, let's say, these are awful examples, but I'm still going to give it, that finds herself on a basketball team where almost everyone on the basketball team, let's just say, this is not every basketball team, but let's just say, has a heavy lesbian influence. What I'm trying to say is that is it even possible that those feelings and that maybe even some of that attraction might be a little bit more impressionable than we think? And this is what I want to say to us as the Christian community. This is where it's so incredibly important for us as Christians to be very, very, very careful about teaching and enforcing a gender identity on our children that's not even in Scripture. What I mean is this, that oftentimes what we do is we teach our children what it means to be a man. We teach our children what it... <laughs> that's... I, I don't know. We teach our... I, I can't go, what it means to be a woman. We, we, we enforce these value systems where we go, boys don't do that. Girls don't do that. And sometimes what we can do is we can actually confuse people in the process. Because let me ask you this. I'm not talking about gender identity right now. I'm talking about this. Is it sin and is it outside of the will of God for a man to want to have long hair and wear a skirt? Is that a sin? Because if that's a sin, William Wallace is going to hell. I'm not talking about gender identity. I'm talking about fashion. If fashion is a social construct, correct? If fashion is a social construct, then we as Christians have to be tremendously careful about reinforcing something that doesn't even exist in the Bible. Young girls, it, it, it used to be that, uh, that sexual challenges were almost primarily and exclusively a male problem and not a woman problem. And now what we're finding with young girls is that many more young girls actually want to transition genders than young boys. And do you know why that is? So much of the problem is this, that they look at the cultural standard of what it means to be beautiful and they go, I'm never going to be able to be like this. There's no way I will ever attain that kind of standard in my life. In fact, many more young girls are watching pornography now than they used to. And do you know what they're seeing in pornography? They're seeing a man rape a woman while he's choking her and beating her. And that little girl is going, if, that what it, if that's what it means to be a woman, then guess what? I want no part of that. And it can create confusion. It's difficult. It's challenging. This is not an easy topic. And here's what I'm also not saying. What I'm also not saying is that I'm also not saying that everyone can choose. That's not what I'm saying. What you're going to find is that some of you, and that there are some people who have been born with a same-sex attraction, they have lived with a same-sex attraction, and you will die with a same-sex attraction. And as a Christian, if you do not have empathy for that, if you do not have empathy for somebody who has struggled with that, with a level of guilt and shame, Somebody in junior high who's walked into a locker room and just gone, I, this is the most uncomfortable experience in the world. Somebody who has been to church and their youth pastor didn't even know that they were struggling with same-sex attraction and just listening to their youth pastor just ridicule gay and lesbian people, because, you know, joking because they didn't know. If, if you don't empathize with somebody who has begged God to take away some of these feelings and maybe even watch pornography in the slightest hope that maybe it would change their orientation, then man, can I, you're a jerk. But at the same time, when it comes to this, when it comes to this idea that can I control it, can I not control it? Is this something that I was born with? Is this something that I was not born with? Here's where I've landed with this. Are you ready for this? Here's where I've landed with this. I'm not sure it matters. Because what you're going to find is this. That once upon a time in the Bible, what happened is that there was a man and woman named Adam and Eve, and they sinned. 
And when sin entered into this world, guess what? There was a sin atomic explosion that happened where you and I are still living in the fallout of what it is that happened many, 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 many years ago. And in the process, what happened is that the image of God was wrecked. Not wrecked completely, but distorted with inside of me. That, that my dispositions, that my, that, that my feelings, that my, that, that my orientation, that my, all, of, all of our orientations were changed in the process. And that for me, that I have a greater orientation towards anger, that my wife has a greater orientation towards worry, and I think it's funny how whenever I sin, it's on purpose, and whenever my wife sins, it's on accident for some reason. But, but here's, here's the deal. I want to blow up at my children every day. Correction, I do blow up at my children every day. And every time I blow up at my children, I feel like crap. But every time I resist that orientation that exists inside of me, I feel like I end up just taking one more step towards true north and who it is that God has created me to be. All I'm trying to say is that for all of us, it doesn't matter who you are, that for all of us, just because a feeling and just because a pull exists on the inside does not mean necessarily that I must, in a fatalistic way, that I have to react to it on the outside. Because let's, let's, let's go back to this idea. Is it, is it a sin for me to be same-sex attracted? Is it a sin for me to be, to, to be tempted by this same-sex attraction? Absolutely not. I mean, this is where we as Christians in this conversation, we've got to be able to lean in when somebody tells us something like, oh, I'm gay, or oh, I'm a lesbian. We've got to be able to lean in because what do you mean by that? Do you mean that you're just struggling to fit in terms of these different categories that society has? Do do you mean that you have these temptations, but that you are fighting it with all of your heart? Because if that's the case, that's not a sin, right? But let's not be mistaken. If what someone is saying is that, that I'm not only tempted by this attraction, but I'm actively pursuing this attraction? If what they're saying is that, you know what, here's what I'm doing, I'm not only having these thoughts, but I'm entertaining these thoughts, and I'm pursuing my sexuality that is then going to be expressed. If I'm going to express, notice how I keep saying action, 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 action. If I am pursuing in action my sexuality between me and somebody, of the same sex, let's not be mistaken that that's a sin. Now, it's not a sin that's greater than any other sin, because if we're honest, heterosexuality has created way more damage in this world than homosexuality. Can I say that? If we we include rape, if we include incest, if we include abortion, if we include divorce, heterosexuality has not done us many favors. I'm not saying it's a bigger sin than anything else. I'm not saying that it's a sin that's unforgivable. All all I'm trying to say is that if you're trying to get me to say that my sexuality in action can be expressed between two people of the same sex, then I just love you too much not to tell you the truth. And if you need a Bible verse, I can give you plenty. But I think it says something when homosexuality is just as frequent, just as acceptable in the ancient world as it is right now. And yet, believe it or not, there is not one, you won't be able to find one Bible verse that affirms it. And while some people urge me to get on the right side of history, like, come on, you just, it's the 21st century. I think I might actually be on the right side of history. 
Given the fact that there is no civilization, that there is no culture, and that there is no world religion that has affirmed this until the sexual revolution in the, in the 1960s. That's a long time. And so what you're going to find is that, yeah, this is, a, this is a complicated topic, isn't it? Let me tell you this. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, I can't believe this, 31 years ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior my freshman year in college. And there was another bombshell that went off in my life. And that was that I accepted Jesus. And Jesus slowly then just began to reorder things in my life. And the things that I thought were important all of a sudden didn't become as important. And the things that weren't important to me became a little bit more important. As, and as I have looked over the trajectory of my life, what I have found is this. That man, Jesus, more and more and more, I want Jesus to become all that I ever want. That's it. I, I wish he was more. I spent a lot of stimulus money on a TV that's too big, so I wish. Evidently, I have a lot of work to do in this area of my life, but here's what I want. I, I, want, I want Jesus to be everything to me. And what I found is this, that over the course of my life, the things that were important to me before have just gone from, from technicolor to black and white. The things that I thought would bring me pleasure before, actually, as I have grown closer to Jesus, have actually not brought me as much pleasure as I thought. And what you're going to find is that even secular, uh, uh, secular sources actually tell us the same thing. Again, in the 2009 American Psychological Association publication, this is a secular sighting, in the 2009 American Psychological Association publication, it said this, that acting on same-sex attractions may not be a fulfilling solution. Let me read that one more time. That acting on, remember, this is not a Christian. Acting on same-sex attractions may not be a fulfilling solution. Listen to this, especially for those whose religious identity is more important to them. Judith Glasgow, chairwoman of the APA task force, said this. We have to acknowledge that for some people, religious identity is such an important part of their lives that it may transcend everything else. And so here's what the author is saying right here. That's this phrase, that we all act out of our identity, right? We all act out of who I perceive myself to be. Whoever I perceive myself to be in the innermost parts of who I am, that is going to be an expression of who I am on the outside. And so here's just a key question that we need to ask, and that's this question right here. Who are you? In the innermost parts of who you are, who are you? Because that is what you will end up acting out. And that's part of the reason why I love the Bible is just because um, even from our conversation before, what we find is that when you and I are part of a shifting world, you and I will have a shifting identity, right? Here's what I love about the Bible. The Bible presents me with an identity that will never change. That I am loved, that I'm accepted, that I'm cherished. And even when God has um, laws, even when God has rules, that it's an opportunity for me to step into faith. And it's an opportunity for me to trust him. A couple quick things. A couple quick things is this right here. Um, so I'm gay, what do I do? So I'm gay, what do I do? I got three quick points for you. Number one is this, keep following Jesus, man. Just keep following Jesus. If you're gay, here's what I want you to do. Man, I want you to go to every church service that you possibly can. For the next two years, here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you to, as much as is possible, just not think about your sexuality. Just try not to think about, honestly, any other priority, except for to just put Jesus at the very center of your life. And so what I'd love for you to do is I'd love for you to go to every church service that you possibly can. I don't want you to miss a one. I want you to sign up for a small group and I want you to go every single week. I want you to sign up for a serving team and I want you to serve every single week. 
You know, when we talk about giving and we, when we talk about tithing, man, I want you to, first, to be the first one to lean into that space and to go, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to align every area of my life with God. And here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you to just listen to God as you try and orient yourself the most towards God as possible. Because let me tell you this, if you want God to speak to you, God will. Um, and church family, I'd love for you to say this. I, I, I'd love to say this uh, as well. Here, here's what I'd love for you to do. I would love for you to give our gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender brothers and sisters as much space and as much grace as they need to process some of these things with God. Because let me tell you this, if the moment I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, if God automatically in that moment told me everything in my life that needed to change, he would destroy me. And I would end up being a wreck, okay? So let's give them the grace and let's give them the space that they need in order to experience God. Billy Graham said this, and I think church, this is where we all want to be, that it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, it's God's job to judge, and it's my job to love, right? And see, yeah, you can clap. And as your pastor for everyone here, every single person who's sitting here, here's what I want you to know, that no matter who you are and that no matter what you struggle with, that you are welcome here, that you are loved here, and that you will always be accepted here. Okay, number two, number two, here's what I want to go through, and that's this, that sex is awesome Let's just pray. <laughs> uh, sex is awesome, but some of you are like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> where are you going with this one? Here's where I'm going. Sex is awesome, but it's not, necessarily, it's not necessary to live a satisfying life. And like, yeah, it was just a woman that amened. It was not a man that amened to that <laughs> right there because all the men are, n now the men are offended. If I haven't offended anyone so far, now the men are like, I hate this church, I'm leaving. Um, but let's look at that line very closely. Sex is awesome, but it is not necessarily, it is not necessary to live a satisfying life, right? Right, do we? Here's what I wanna ask you, Christian, do you really believe that? Because Jesus, Jesus never had sex. Did he live a satisfying, did, did he live life to its fullest? Paul says that it's better to be single than it is to be married. Do you and I truly, truly, truly believe that? Um, most likely, uh, this is where I could be wrong, but most likely, did you know this, that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were most likely eunuchs. Most likely eunuchs. Do you know why I say that? Because no one was ever allowed to climb that high in the royalty corporate ladder without not being a threat anymore to the bloodline, okay? Jesus, here's where I'm going with this. Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, he describes a eunuch as not only somebody that, eunicism, that being a eunuch was forced upon, you know what I'm saying? Like Daniel didn't have a choice, like it was um, but, <laughs> but he also described a eunuch as somebody who chose to be a eunuch. In other words, somebody who was, somebody who was celibate, somebody who chose a lifestyle of celibacy. And just in case you want to know, here's what the Bible has to say about somebody who's a eunuch or somebody who's a celibate. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 3 through 5 says this, To the eunuch who holds fast to my covenant, to them... I will give them within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name that is better than sons and daughters. That I will take this idea of family and I'll give you something even better. 
I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. In the Old and New Testament, there were people in the church who embraced celibacy. And you have to understand that celibacy wasn't about sacrificing sex. Celibacy was about sacrificing family. Celibacy was about sacrificing hopes. Celibacy was about sacrificing dreams. Celibacy was about sacrificing your retirement plan, if we're to be honest. And yet, in light of all of those things, in the Old Testament and New Testament, there were people who chose celibacy. There were people who pursued celibacy. There were people who were called to celibacy because they wanted to make, literally, the most radical commitment to God and the most radical commitment to the local church possible. And here's the thing. If you and I are going to call someone else in a same-sex relationship to a life of celibacy, here's what they're wondering right here. That if I give up my same-sex relationship, church, will you be there for me when I need you? Or are you just going to tell me that it's wrong and just close your garage door on me? Because what is at the sacred core of homosexuality is at the sacred core of any relationship. It's not about sex. It's about companionship. It's the fact that nobody wants to die alone. That you don't want to die alone and neither do I. So that's number two. Number three, the third option is this. The third option is that you could pursue a heterosexual relationship. And I I freely admit that this is not for everybody. What you will find, church, is that heterosexuality is not what God has called me to. Heterosexuality is not the promised land. God has not called me to be a heterosexual. God has called me to be holy. Can I get an amen to that? But there are some people who say, okay, well, if that's an option that honors God, well, then I want to pursue that option. And there are some people who try and learn that. There are some people who get married as a result of that. But here's what they say. They always kind of feel like they're wearing the wrong shoes on their feet. And they just kind of feel like they're driving on the wrong side of the street. And I would would just say this. There is not one person in this room that does not live in this gap of a life where there is some type of sexual frustration in their life, right? There is no one heterosexual, homosexual, there is no one in this room that does not live with some amount of sexual frustration in their life. It's impossible. All I'm saying is that in that gap, sometimes we just learn to trust God more. Man, I'm glad I'm done with that message. I got one more. Man, I was wrecked. Camera's still rolling, I don't care. I was, I was wrecked after that divorce and remarriage message, and I was like, oh man, I'm only halfway through this thing. But why don't we do this? Why don't we all bow our heads and pray? Can we do this? Let's all stand right now. And Father, this is what we want to do, God. We want to honor you, God, with all of our lives. We want to lay everything at your feet. And we just want you to be pleased with us, God. This is what we pray for, Lord Jesus. We pray that, God, that in our hyper-individualistic community, Um, that in our uh, hyper-individualistic American attitude, Father, that we would not see you as my Father, but that we would see you as our Father, our Father who art in heaven. And what that means at times is that there are other people in our community that need us, Father, and I pray that we would always enter into those spaces with grace and love and mercy. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for today. We pray all of these things in your Son's name and all God's people said. Sir
Thank you so much, God. Because not a single one of us in this room deserves that love that you so freely give. And so we accept that this morning. We thank you for loving us the way that you do, God. Unconditionally, that no matter what we do, no matter what choices we make, when we doubt you, when we turn away from you, you love us come after us. You're standing there, arms open wide, saying, come home to me. Come back to my design, the way I designed you in my image. The image of love, God. So we acknowledge that this morning. We thank you and we praise your holy name. Above all else, we praise your holy name, God. We love you give you this week, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Thank you guys so much for singing with us. Our God is so good, so gracious. Please remember, if you need prayer for anything, our prayer team is going to be up front. They would love to surround you guys and pray with you um, for whatever you need, but if not, we'll see you guys next week.